So I'm going to be talking about um, improving intelligibility in multi-party conversations using spatially rendered voice and how we do this in the WebITC ecosystem. So first, I'm going to talk about um, what Dolby is doing in the communication space, because we've been in the communication space under the scenes for quite a while. We actually started doing voice communications about 12 years ago in the computer games industry. I'll talk about that a bit later. I'm quite passionate about that area, as a few people know. Um, in the conferencing space, we started with the audio conferencing providers in about 2013. And we worked with BT, PGI, and Intercall. And with these guys, we provided their server and client voice processing chain. So we had a media server and we had client SDKs. We actually also processed their, voice, their um, phone calls as well as their VoIP calls. And so we built out a voice chain which was optimized for multi-party conferencing. And we also had a proprietary spatial client, which was a download, which could provide a spatial conferencing experience, which you'll hear more about later. Then, well, then we started working with the video conferencing providers, such as BlueJeans, Hi5, and just recently, GoToMeeting. With these guys, we actually had to start working with WebRTC quite closely, because we had providers which were WebRTC-centric. So we had to provide our experience within, within the browser. We also started building hardware, video conferencing hardware, that also works within the WebRTC ecosystem. So now we've actually started providing a service ourselves. And so we've got a service with APIs, which you can build your own Dolby-powered conferencing service. It's a service called VoxEat. And the aim here is to give all developers access to the underlying voice technology that we use with the service providers, and also some of the um, voice and video technology which we have across the wider Dolby business from the entertainment industry. We've got a lot of cool stuff um, in DSP. But the topic of this conversation is going to be spatial voice communications. And our research in this area started quite a while ago. We started doing research in 2004 with experiments and academic publications. Based on the available psychoacoustic research at the time, we really believed we could improve the um, we could improve real-time communications online. Essentially, we believed that um, rendering voices spatially would enable us to better understand communications, natural communications, which involves overlapping speech and other sounds. I'll, I'll go into more detail about the importance of overlapping speech and natural communications on this next slide. We know in online communications, you want to avoid overlapping speech as much as possible, so everyone goes on mute. Um, however, in face-to-face -face communications, there is a lot of overlapping speech. Um, and overlapping speech itself enables you to have much more faster interactive turn-taking. It also enables you to have affirmations during the conversation. And those affirmations enable you, as a speaker, to understand what's happening with the people you're speaking with. If you're on, in an online conference, everyone's silent, you wonder what's going on. Um, so a study by... Um, Schreberg in 2001 looked at a large collection of meetings, face-to-face -face meetings with four to six, four to eight participants. And what they did was they went through and tagged cases where there was overlapping speech and also affirmations. And the interesting thing they came back with was about 45% of talk bursts had some overlapping speech and about 46% had affirmations and other back-channel sounds like mm, uh-huh. Um, so... So that, that was informal communications. We all know social communications has a lot more um, overlapping speech and also laughter. And there's studies looking at the amount of laughter in conversations as well. Face-to-face -face conversations have a lot of laughter, overlapping speech, laughter, overlapping laughter, overlapping speech, and you know, you know how it is. In network games, it's, um, it's, even, it's different there as well. We've had a lot of experience in network games. And in the massively multiplayer games we've deployed our technology in in the past, we've seen about 5% speech. So people rarely speak. But when they do speak, they speak over the top of each other. And you can actually end up not just two people speaking over the top of each other having a conversation. You can have four people having two-way conversations over the top of each other in the middle of a battle. 
So overlapping speech in, in games is actually a really big thing. So we seem to be able to cope with overlapping speech in the wor real world really well. And essentially our brain receives two electric signals, which is the linear sum of the amplitude, amplitude time representation of all the sounds we're hearing at the time. And somehow our brain is able to pull those apart and we can recognize a voice to the left, a voice in front, and road noise to the right. And we can decide to concentrate on one of those voices and you know, listen to it and understand what's going on. Uh, one of the, there's a large area of research that looks at how our brain does this, which is called auditory scene analysis. We've got a lot of expertise in that in Dolby. But the key thing for us here is that one of the big um, cues that enables you, our brain to pull this apart is the spatial separation of the voices. And there's an interaural time difference and an interaural uh, volume difference, which is very important for this as well. One of the earliest studies looking at this was um, a study by um, Colin Cherry in 1953. Colin Cherry um, coined the term the cocktail party problem, which is essentially how do we understand communication in a crowded, noisy environment where everyone's speaking, and how we can pick out our voice being yelled out across the room in that case as well. He did a couple of very early experiments to look at the impact of se the separation of voices. In the, in the first test, he took two spoken passages, mixed them together, and played them in headphones to participants and asked them to read out uh, the passage one while it was playing. The interesting thing was they made a lot of errors, and it was really difficult for them to read out that passage one, and very stressful. The voices were very strained. When they played, in test two, they played passage one in the left ear, passage two in the right ear, and the participants could easily read back passage one without any strain in their voice. It was very easy to do. But the other interesting note here was they asked them about passage two, and they couldn't say anything about passage two. It was like their brain had filtered out passage two completely, and they just focused on passage one. Our ability to be able to concentrate on a voice and filter out another voice or other sound is called spatial release from masking. Now, there's lots of experiments in this area, and I had a few more slides before with more of those experiments, but I was told it was getting too academic, so I left those out. But there are several things to consider. Um, if it's a noise instead of a voice, your brain is good at filtering that out as well. Not as effective, but still pretty good. The larger the separation, the better, but 15 degrees is OK. Similar masking sounds reduces the effect. So if you have two people sound very similar, it is beneficial to have them spatially separated, um, but the effect, the benefit is a little bit less. And more voice maskers in the same location end up being a bit noise-like, and the effect is reduced there as well. So there's certain things you have to take into consideration when you're building a system around this. So how we've implemented this for conferencing. So in order to replicate our, our spatial listening ability in a conference, we use um, spatial rendering in headphones. And we use what uh, Dolby's version of a generalized HRTF, a head-related transfer function. Actually, Dolby's got very good technology in this area, as you probably imagine. It's a bit more complex than this. But essentially, a HRTF function models what a sound in a particular location will end up being when it hits your ear canal. And so effectively, it is reproducing a sound over there in your headset. Implementing this in conferencing, there are a few considerations. When we first started, we used one thing that's common, which is uh, N loudest mixing, which means you mix, N was always three. You mix the three loudest voices. The problem with that is when you have four voices and one's cutting in, in and out and it's rendered over there and you can actually hear it cutting in and out, it's quite disturbing. So we really had to redesign the audio chain here and make sure that we only we mixed all voices. You didn't want people cutting in and out. So we actually spent a lot of time on the noise suppression algorithms and also the VAD, a voice activity detector. A bit more on the implementation side in the client server. The clients all send mono, 
We have spatial devices, which I'll talk about later, but in this case, the clients all send mono and receive spatial. For our Dolby native clients, which we use when we can, we use a, a codec called DVC2. It's our um, Dolby voice codec. And this is designed for spatial mixing. And in this case, we do all our DSP in the client. We encode it in our codec, and we send it to the server. And the server is able to mix and create a spatial scene using this codec without having to go back to the time domain. And it's really um, computationally cheap for us. We can do many thousands on a server. It's, it's, to us, it's similar to forwarding. When we have browser-based clients, the clients use the existing WebRTC um, DSP opus encoding and send it to our server. And we have to do a bit more heavy lifting in the server. We, do, we implement our VAD, voice activity detector. We do leveling, noise suppression. And we do a combined mix render to our head-related transfer function. And then we encode the result in, with opus, stereo, and send it to the listener. So the listener is hearing this surround scene. It's more computationally expensive, but we've got quite good DSP in the server. So we've actually got this running at scale with service providers at the moment that are predominantly WebRTC. However, in a perfect world, we would obviously like to do more of the processing in the client than the server. A bit about using spatial. We've used spatial a lot over the years. We started in game, as I mentioned before. And in games, we rendered voices based upon the location of the avatars in the virtual world. And we did distance-based attenuation. You can do cool things like having dif different distance attenuation profiles based upon when you, whether you know people or not. Um, we did occlusion based on in-game geometry. And we integrated with some pretty big games in those days. We integrated with the largest game in China, which is ZT Online which had over a million peak concurrent users. So we had a massive installation of our, our servers. On the audio conferencing side, you don't have vid visual cues with just plain audio conferencing. But that's, that's not really important. We looked at virtual worlds, but the virtual world itself is a distraction. So what we did was automatic layout. We just put the first person in front, second person to the side, and then just swapped and built out a scene in front. One thing that's important here is you want to restrict the scene to the front. It's a little bit disturbing having someone talking to you from behind. Uh, with video conferencing, you do have visual cues. So it's better to have um, render left and right um, correctly. Getting that wrong is noticeable. Other errors, so rendering someone over there when they're pictured over there, doesn't really matter. Your brain just fixes it up for you quite nicely. And we use that for some tricks um, to, to reduce CPU complexity. With our hardware devices, we've built spatial capture devices, um, which have got an array microphone for 360 degree capture. And we mix that into the spatial scene in the server. And as we don't want people behind you, because it's a bit creepy, we fold it and put it in front in the server. And we create a scene, mix that with all the mono participants. The hardware we built, and we've got Jim here who uh, ran the, the Jim and, and Venu who built the hardware here. Um, we built hardware which um, was WebRTC first. It's got a Chrome embedded framework for the dev environment, which enables our partners to port their WebRTC applications across to our hardware and then change it so it's more room appropriate. And we put our Dolby DSP native in the underlying stack. And we added SIP video support second. So it was more important for us to make, make it WebRTC first, and then SIP. SIP was a couple of releases later. Um, but we do have some partners using our devices just against WebRTC services without um, Dolby technology in them, such as Amazon Chime. But in that case, it's, it's mono capture and mono playback, obviously. So to wrap up, we built an effective spatial communication system that works with WebRTC clients, that takes advantage of our brain's ability to be able to understand overlapping speech and interact much more naturally. And we've deployed this at scale with video conferencing service providers. The next steps for us require some help from Google and others here. Um, 
firstly, we're going to integrate with Electron, which that's, that's relatively straightforward, to enable people to develop Electron clients with that technology. But really, we want to implement our technology in the client using WebAssembly. And at the moment, the only way is to use the RTC data channel, which we will do, but it's, it's not our preferred approach. So we're really keen to get our technology into the browser with WebAssembly and be able to use the, the normal peer connection. Thank you.